Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Nichols Fader, and I am a, a professor of gynecology, obstetrics, and oncology. I'm a GYN oncologist at Johns Hopkins, and I am the president elect of the Society of Gynecologic Oncology. And it is my great pleasure uh, to be here uh, to join you for the OCRA annual conference. It's an honor and privilege to, to be a faculty member, and I want to thank Audra and Sarah, Tracy, Elizabeth, and the entire OCRI team for putting on this amazing conference and for inviting me. And while I would normally be uh, presenting about rare tumor ovarian cancer work or ovarian cancer treatment advances, a far more inspirational topic, I'm going to be talking to you today about um, updates on the U.S. chemotherapy drug shortages and what I think all patients, survivors, and patient advocates need to, to know. And so I'm going to start my slide deck, and hopefully you can all see my slides. Um, but I, uh, in terms of some disclosures, I, um, I'm the president-elect of the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, and I co-lead the Society um, Drug Shortage Response. The SGO, or Society of Human Oncology, is one of the largest organizations in the world uh, supporting providers of uh, uh, patients with gynecologic cancer, as well as patients, survivors, advocates, and our gynecologic on community members. I'm also a member of the ASCO Drug Shortage Advisory Group. Uh, I serve on the drug shortage team at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And I'm obviously going to talk today about a very somber public health crisis. But I want to say, first of all, and what I really want you to take home from this is in gynecologic oncology, we specialize in hope. And compared to where we were about a year ago with the drug shortages, things are much improved. I'm going to hopefully give you some good news overall today while couching it with lessons learned and what we're doing um, as providers and scientists and policy advocates working with the OCRA and other um, wonderful foundations and organizations for who support women with cancer. Um, to um, not only affect short-term solutions uh, for this problem, but also developing better common sense and innovative long-term solutions to prevent future drug shortages. And this is part of our SGO team. We have a 20 plus member team working on the uh, chemotherapy drug shortages. This is one of our top patient and legislative priorities at the moment. And we've put in many thousands of hours of work on this and we're very proud of the work we're doing and collaborating with the American Cancer Society, ASCO, OCRA, the Foundation for Women's Cancer, and, and many other um, organizations. And this all at the center of all of this are our patients. Um, while chemotherapies are among the most important medicines and tools we use in our treatment toolbox as oncologists, the drug shortage is, 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 has mostly impacted our patients. And this is, uh, many of you may know this wonderful woman. This is Tony Desimitz, um, an ovarian cancer survivor who is a fierce uh, uh, ovarian cancer advocate and um, has been a, a wonderful advocate as well for the on the drug shortages campaign, working with us at the SGO and with other organizations. She's a former military veteran and law enforcement officer and just a wonderful human being. And so it's for patients like Tony, um, and those uh, women all around the country that, you know, were doing this. And so what I want to say, first of all, in terms of the good news, is that chemotherapy um, uh, treatments are advancing and expanding very, very rapidly now. And um, chemo drugs, as I said, are among the most important medicines we use in ovarian cancer care. And with a better understanding of the molecular mechanisms of the disease and our knowledge of uh, about how to best treat and target the disease, basically our treatments and research are snowballing in a wonderful way and leading the evolution of many new treatments um, that are helping women hopefully live better, longer lives. And many treatment enhancements in the last decade have we've certainly seen an extension of survival and improvement of quality of life for women with ovarian fallopian tube and peritoneal cancers. In the past two decades, we've seen also that using various combinations of chemotherapies um, that are presently used in the treatment of ovarian cancers have led to even better outcomes than using just one or two at a time. And let me advance this slide. Cytotoxic chemotherapy um, is um, 
one of the most important types of medicines that we use to treat um, cancer. And this is using chemicals or antibiotics that are toxic to cells and prevent cells from replicating, dividing, or growing. And this is one of the most common tools we use to treat cancer. And so many of the common chemo, most common chemotherapy agents we use to treat ovarian cancer, such as cisplatin, carboplatin, paclitaxel, doxel, gemcitabine, and many others, these are all considered cytotoxic drugs. They work by affecting the DNA or the genetic makeup of the cell or preventing the cell from dividing by disrupting its, um, its architecture, if you will. And many of these cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs have been around for several decades. They're known as generic injectables because they're off patent. They're no longer produced by just one company. They can be produced by multiple uh, corporations. Um, they're cheaper uh, drugs because of that. And we, we use them, however, uh, despite how long they've been around, we use them as the cornerstone of treatment for ovarian cancer. But the problem with cytotoxic chemotherapy agents is because these are older off patent or generic drugs. Um, even so, they're very complex to manufacture. They require several raw materials, many of which are manufactured overseas. And for the limited number of manufacturers that supply these drugs, return on investment or the revenue that's produced um, for the manufacturers isn't very high with these drugs. Um, and 50, 50 to 60 percent of the chemo drugs are actually manufactured outside of the United States. And on top of that, because these drugs are um, inexpensive in terms of revenue production for these companies, and some of the alternative drugs the companies are producing, like some of the newer targeted or immunotherapy drugs or antibody drug conjugates, um, might generate more profit for some of these companies. A uh, few of these companies now manufacture these precious drugs, even though they're extraordinarily important in the treatment of uh, patients with, with gynecologic cancers. So, um, so while we know that the future of cancer care is targeted and precision based with some of these newer drugs, which is very, you know, is helping us um, achieve better gains for our patients, we still know that cytotoxic chemotherapy remains the cornerstone of treatment. And the reason for that is that these, are, these drugs work quite well and they work for some time. Um, and so, you know, up to 90 to 95 percent of, of patients with ovarian cancer are going to have an initial response to some of these drugs and some a very prolonged response. They're also very well studied drugs in multiple clinical trials, so they still remain very important to us. However, um, in the last decade or so, we'll, we've seen that several chemo drugs have been in and out of shortage in the United States for years. Unfortunately, 2023 brought about record shortages, um, according to statistics from the National Cancer Institute, from the federal government, the SGO, ASCO, and others. And perhaps um, one of the most, uh, one of the largest chemotherapy drug shortages in history. And when we look at national drug shortages in the US, they're not a new problem. They've existed again for decades. But what we see is that chemotherapy drugs are often in the top five class of drugs that are in shortage in the United States. And when we look at data from the University of Utah, we see that we don't always understand the reason why. And that's a problem. You can see in this little this little pie graph down in the bottom left hand corner here that in 56 percent of cases, either we didn't know the reason for the shortage of a particular drug or the manufacturer didn't supply the reason. But you can also see that common reasons um, can include quality and control issues and supply chain or personnel problems and that sort of thing. The pandemic certainly didn't help with that. And so in order to solve this problem and make sure that every patient has the treatment that she needs to succeed in, on her cancer journey and with her cancer treatment, we need to make sure that we understand why drug shortages are happening. And that involves looking at several steps along the drug manufacturing and delivery line to understand that. And the reality is that, um, that this is a pretty complex global drug supply chain. 
Um, again, these a lot of these cancer drugs are manufactured up to 60% of them outside of the US that we rely on in, in the US for our patients. You start with a supplier who manu um, who helps fund this process, the manufacturer, uh, so the supplier might provide raw materials and funding the manufacturer actually creates or pr produces the drug. Then you usually have a middleman, if you will, or a wholesaler that helps bring the drug to pharmacies and hospitals. And what's happening here is that the wholesaler drives prices down even further, which is awesome for patients in terms of like, of course, we all want great drugs at cheaper prices. Um, but what, what that does by driving those prices even lower, it puts a further pinch on the manufacturers who, who derive even less of a profit from those drugs. And I am sorry that I'm talking about this in business terms. We're going to, we're going to humanize this in just a moment. Um, but it's really important for us to understand that there is a, an, in an industry component or a private sector component to this problem that we as clinicians and the scientists in ovarian cancer, care are really trying to understand so that we can help with research and policy solutions, um, both at the government level and at the private sector level. And so once the drugs get to the pharmacy or hospital, then they're distributed to the patients, often in special oncology pharmacy by oncology pharmacists. And then it gets to the patient and the healthcare provider. So who exactly is the customer here? Well, you can see it's pretty complex. There's lots of customers. You have the payers, who are the hospitals, the insurance, the government that help pay for the treatment and sometimes patients themselves in many cases are paying co-pays or some paying out of pocket for some drugs. We have the purchasers of the drugs. Um, these are the group purchasing organizations or those wholesale middlemen um, and the hospitals. We have the decision makers who's making the decisions about what drugs go where and to whom by the patient as the ultimate decision maker, but the physician and pharmacist insurance. And then, you know, you obviously have um, the, the patient herself who, who is utilizing the drugs. So th there's power in the four Ps, if you will, right? Payer, purchaser, physician, pharmacist, and patients. And this is the last mile of the supply chain that we must connect and really work on together in order to achieve, you know, the best outcome here. So why do drug shortages happen? Well, they can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, in many cases, it could be a shortage of raw materials. Uh, a demand for a drug is greater than the supply that's available. There may be a safety issue that results in a drug recall. That doesn't happen often for chemotherapy because this is, this is studied and the um, chemotherapy drugs have been studied very closely for, you know, for safety. But often a quality control issue is at the heart of the problem and, and, and constitutes, and I'm going to tell you what happened with the cisplatin carboplatin shortage here in a moment, and it was absolutely, it all started with a quality control issue at a particular manufacturer. The pandemic, for example, brought about, about shipping delays or distribution problems, and so you can see that there can be all kinds of different factors that can, can result in issues here. So. Um, Let's talk about the situation. Back in November, December of 2022, um, I recall I mentioned that many of the pharmaceuticals or chemotherapy drugs are, that are sold in the U.S. are manufactured overseas. And in November, the, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA that oversees the quality control with the drugs that are approved and used in the United States, basically made a surprise visit to one of those plants that that makes chemotherapy in India. This was owned by Intus Pharmaceuticals. And the inspectors could not believe what they were seeing. They observed multiple violations related to quality control and data integrity. Um, you may have read about this in the New York, New York Times. This came out in April in the Times. Um, there was a lot of just really shady stuff going on here. And the the FDA was really concerned about the quality of the chemotherapy drugs being produced. And so plant the plant halted production. The FDA said, nope, this has to be fixed. We have to have safety first. Quality quality, and safety must be preserved. And it was the first domino in the chain that would lead to a nationwide shortage of chemotherapy drugs. That particular manufacturer primarily produced cisplatin, the, you know, the sister drug to carboplatin. Both are used very commonly in ovarian cancer. 
So when cisplatin became scarce, because carboplatin and cisplatin are very similar in terms of their effectiveness in, in treating many cancers, including ovarian cancer, people started using carboplatin instead of cisplatin and it, carboplatin got overused and that went into shortage. Intus Pharmaceuticals had slowed down its production of carboplatin to really focus on cisplatin production. And you might say, well, what about all the other manufacturers out there that are producing this drug? Where, there, where there's only about seven, eight, nine companies in the world that, that supply the United States that are producing these drugs, if you can believe it. And with this being the largest manufacturer of the platinum drugs, carboplatin and cisplatin, when their production came to a halt, it had a screeching effect on the rest of the industry as well. And a lot of other companies kind of generated more, more drug, but they couldn't keep up for a little while. And so very quickly that started to affect the manufacture of other chemotherapy drugs with methotrexate, fluorouracil, docetaxel, then paclitaxel, dox, doxel, doxorubicin, and other drugs um, started going into shortages reported by the American uh, Society of Hospital Pharmacists and, and the FDA. We see in the United States that unfortunately the drug shortage issues are increasing over time. You can see this data again from the University of Utah shows that this is the number of drugs in shortage every year. And that increased significantly in 2022. We're expecting that to be about the same or slightly more in 2023. And again, the problem is that we have a consolidated market with little incentive for manufacturers to produce these more these, these inexpensive generic cytotoxic chemotherapy injectable drugs. Injectable just means we inject them uh, through an IV. Um, and But these drugs are so vital to the treatment of our patients. And so when we have quality control and manufacturing issues, um, we have distributors driving down the prices further and raw materials that might be difficult to obtain, this leads to what's called a market failure. So, um, the other issue is that none of the current chemotherapy drugs that are in shortage, we noted, were on the FDA's essential medicines list, despite many of these being curative, very helpful drugs to help our patients live years longer. If the FDA created the list of essential medicines a few years ago during the pandemic to ensure a supply, a central supply of drugs that we never want to run out of as a nation. So think of things like antibiotics and uh, inhalers for people with asthma, um, drugs for the intensive care unit and that sort of thing. Well, I would argue very strongly, and as of many, uh, and we'll talk about our work with the FDA and on Capitol Hill, that chemotherapy, because they are life-saving drugs, should be on the FDA essential medicines list. But the other thing we learned that was interesting, most people think the FDA has a lot of control over this process, but in fact, it has limited authority to intervene um, in the, you know, into private companies, other than when there's a big quality control issue as, as was revealed with Intus Pharmaceutical. And there was another uh, uh, arm of the government, the Administration of Strategic Preparedness and Response that has been developed um, that has helped during the pandemic as well to oversee natural disasters, uh, public health emergencies, this was one of the organizations that helped, you know, with the rapid production of the COVID-19 vaccine during the pandemic, for example. And what we found here in our research at SGO and with other organizations and at Hopkins with my colleagues is that nobody has real federal ownership of the problem of drug shortages. It's not the FDA that's fully responsible. It's not the White House. It's not Congress. It's not the Administration of Strategic Preparedness and Response. So, there that was a part part of the problem here um and so this is something that we're going to talk more about uh, in a little bit about what we did and so i want to tell you why things are a lot better now because i gave you a lot of the bad news stuff up first but in fact this mobilized the good thing that has come out of this is how much this has mobilized several cancer societies uh, and and I was so proud that it's the gynecologic cancer organizations that really came out first uh, with um, a response to this. And so we were literally, I don't know if you like Wallace and Gromit, I love, I love this cartoon, but we were literally laying the track down about what to do in the situation to keep our patients safe and on track during this process as the train was leaving the station. And so we were the first oncology society to put out a statement to alert the public and to and alert patients about the drug shortage in April um, on April 26th. 
that there was a shortage of carboplatin and cisplatin. This generated over 100,000 views on Twitter. Um, and we had this on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, we sent emails out to patient advocates. And, and, and we also sent a message to our gynecologic patients, advocates, and community led by Dr. Ginger Gardner, who's chair of the Foundation for Women's Cancer that works very closely, is our, is our foundational arm of the SGO. Um, to let our patients know, hey, this is happening, but we're on top of it. We're going to work to keep you safe and get you more information as it evolves. And so one of the first things we did was we worked and we, we made recommendations for any patient with cancer who was on one of these drugs about what pharmacies could do at their hospitals to preserve more drug supply. And so not all hospitals had a complete shortage of this drug. Some of them were just running low. And so we basically um, made recommendations such as making sure we were using every single drop of chemotherapy in the vials, which believe it or not, isn't, wasn't always a practice before shortages. Um, and so if one patient uses up, you know, if there's like 100 milliliters of drug in a vial and one patient requires 75, using that 25 for another patient and scheduling patients in an infusion center, chemotherapy center, to make sure that we were maximizing the supply of those drugs. We had talked about if a patient would benefit equally from another drug without compromising her survival, could she be switched to another drug for a short term in order to mitigate the supply? We also talked about other excellent uh, you know, pharmacy techniques. And our, we worked very closely with several pharmacists to develop this. We immediately sent out a survey to our SGO members and to our patient advocates to find out what was happening on the ground with this. And we found out that our colleagues all around the country were faced with this. I'm so worried I'm not going to be able to offer my patient standard of care therapy. We got very little notice about this shortage. What should we do? Um, you know, it, it was it was very difficult a lot of moral injury for for providers uh who we live for helping our patients live longer lives and you know we were very worried about not having the right right drugs for our patients and we heard from 200 members in over 40 states as, as experiencing shortages at their institutions way back in april and may um, we also sent out an fwc patient survey and we heard from 35 patients in 18 states this was just the early results of the survey we've since heard from many. I'm very grateful for all the ovarian cancer survivors who responded to this. It was primarily patients with ovarian cancer who did respond. And 30% of our patients were telling us very early on during the shortage that they had experienced a change or a delay in treatment due to the drug shortage. And we heard these very heart-wrenching like sentiments from our patients. You know, I am newly diagnosed. I'm being prioritized, but my medication may change or be reduced. It's not fair, you know, that we have to be put in these positions or that doctors have to make these decisions. I anticipate needing more chemo in the fall, and I'm worried about availability. Dealing with a cancer diagnosis is challenging enough without having to have fear or worry about will the treatment that I need be available for me. And so we went on a major campaign at this point. We went to the press because we really felt that the press was going to help get the federal government response accelerated. This is one of the first pieces that came out from the New York Times. I was fortunate to be quoted in it. I helped, we, we helped define this as a public health emergency back in April. The NCCN, the National Conference of Cancer Network, these are all of the academic cancer centers in the U.S. that help define the standards of care for all cancers in men and women and children. They also did a, a survey and found a significant shortage happening at many of the NCCN, some of the biggest cancer centers across the country. And so they got involved um, in ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, um, really helped us get involved and they endorsed the work that we were doing. And we started working together with ASCO, with NCCN, and with other agencies at this point. And we got to a point where in you know late summer, we had 15 indispensable injectable cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs in simultaneous shortage. Now, that didn't mean that hospitals didn't have any drug. Again, many hospitals had drug, but it was just in short supply. But again, these were these are curative intent, not only for ovarian cancer patients, which I know this is what we're here to talk about today, 
but for many of the most common cancers, uh, other common cancers like breast, lung, bladder, testicular, uterine, leukemia, and so on. And it was projected to impact about 500,000 Americans. I would love to talk with some of you about your experiences and whether you were personally impacted. The NCCN, when you look at the number of recommendations for standard of care therapy, you'll see why cisplatin and carboplatin is so very important. It is used for more than 100 clinical indications to treat 14 different cancers in adults and children. So it is vital for ovarian cancer survivors and it is equally vital for many others. And so it's a very commonly used drug. So we engaged in this multi-pronged approach. Again, we went to the press and we'll talk more about that, but we had a very substantive approach in terms of developing an immediate response to help providers and patients. So we, re we developed what are called rapid drug commu communiques, where we talked about, again, what are the pharmacy techniques to preserve drug every single drop? What are our safe alternative drugs that can be used here that have been studied in clinical trials that are as good or almost as good as the drugs that might be in shortage for a patient so that we can keep her on track, we can keep her survival in gear, and we can you know, do everything we can to, to not allow this to disrupt our patients' lives. We, we developed webinars um, on multiple topics to help that were some were patient facing, which we'll talk about, some were for providers, how to make choices about this um, at the institutional level. How do you find emergency drug if your patient absolutely needs drug and there's only one type of chemo that works for her cancer? We also help create toolkits um, when we worked with insurance companies so that so that patients would not be denied an alternative treatment if it came to that um, when it got to the insurance company label. So we, we notified a lot of insurance companies, hey, this is going on. We need to be sure that you're aware and that you do not deny patients necessary life-saving treatment if it goes a little bit off course because this is what we need to do right now. Um, but a lot of this was around patient support, supportive services and a blog for patients, webinars for patients, um, pa um, letting patients contact us so that we could help them find drug if possible. And we heard from several patients. We'll talk about that in just a second. We went on a social media blitz to educate the general public about this. And one of the most important things we focused on was the legislative and regulatory and policy response to this, um, uh, which was immediate engagement with the FDA, the White House, uh, congressional leaders, um, in order to, to let, let them know what was going on, and then working with many oncology societies um, in this regard. Um, so I'm not going to go through this. this um, you know, if you're on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now there, you can see a lot of our work, but on our website available to anyone, you'll find the um, seven communiques that we developed um, for each type of cancer that we treat as gynecologic oncologists. We also talked about what to do when a patient's on a clinical trial and how to mitigate that if she's on a drug that um, that's in shortage. And we had a large uh, webinar for patients, advocates, and survivors, so we could hear directly from them. We had patients and advocates on as faculty on the webinar. Having patient advocates at the at this table is vital because legislators want to hear from patients more than even from us. They want to know what's happening to everyday citizens in their states, their constituents, and how this affected them. And so the patient um, uh, aspect of this was. I cannot stress enough how vital it is. For anyone who's interested in, you can go to www.sgo.org and find the chemotherapy drug shortage information, or you can use your phones um, for this QR code and it'll take you right to that site, which gives you access to all of those webinars and all of that information. But we, you know, I wanted to give a couple patient scenarios, um, you know, that have occurred and, um, and so how sort of we respond to this. So one of our patients, uh, you know, in the webinar was like, I'm being treated for stage three C ovarian cancer after debulking surgery and carboplatin is what I need right now. And it's in shortage at my institution. Well, what can I do? And so, um, so if there was carboplatin there, we talked with, you know, hospital systems about how, again, how to preserve that drug. 
we created at each hospital and we created within the SGO guidelines for who should take priority. And we hate the fact that we had to do this. It was terrible, but in a, in a shortage situation, you have to emphasize who takes priority. And we wanted to make sure, especially that gynecologic cancer patients and ovarian cancer patients in particular um, took priority at cancer centers across the country because the platinums are so vital to, to the treatment of this disease. And so the national guidelines we created there, I think were useful at several hospital systems to allow those systems to say, okay, anyone with a newly diagnosed ovarian cancer is going to be a priority patient. Anyone who's getting second line ovarian cancer, meaning at the cancer has come back, but you're still a candidate for carboplatin. Well, you might still benefit from years from that. And so it, it, while it may or may not be curative at that point, it can still be very beneficial. And we also created a list of resources for like, what are reasonable alternatives to consider if carboplatin is not available, if cisplatin is not available. There's another drug called oxaliplatin that's in the same family that's been really well studied in ovarian cancer. And that was used at some hospitals as well. It's another platinum, works pretty well, especially when combined with other therapies. So, so we got creative and sort of out of the box. We also worked with patients who were on clinical trials. So this is a patient said, I just enrolled in a clinical trial with carboplatin. I heard it's unsorted. What, what is going to happen? Well, we definitely, you know, thought it was important, of course, to prioritize patients on trial, but we felt very strongly at the SGO, whether you're on trial or off trial, patients must be prioritized equally based on whether the drug that they need is, you know, is the most effective drug possible. And if there isn't an effective alternative, then those patients needed to be prioritized. And so many clinical trials uh, programs around the country develop guidelines for what could be substituted again. So if you didn't have carboplatin, but you had cisplatin, you could give cisplatin. If you didn't have either, you could give oxaliplatin for a little bit of time. And then that only was for a few weeks for most patients. And then they were able to get the drug that they needed at their next cycle. Um, the ASCO uh, team endorsed the SGO guidelines. Again, we had a media blitz and talked to many different media outlets uh, and did several interviews with patient advocates. Uh, if you go on NPR's website, you'll hear beautiful Tony you know, Desimit's uh, wonderful uh, interview on NPR and just the, her courage, uh, you know, in this in the in the face of uh, her institution, the dr one of the drugs she needed was in shortage. And with patient advocates, nurses, pharmacists, community members, um, physicians, and scientists, you know, we've really gone uh, to, to on a campaign to have uh, to amplify diverse voices, and especially to look at patients in underserved areas or in rural areas who may have been even more affected by this problem. Um, so you'll find a lot of that, uh, if you're interested in any of that coverage on this website, it, this impacted my own patients and right in my neck of the woods. What we did at our hospital, what many hospitals did is they created these multidisciplinary teams. We would meet several times a week to talk about the drug situation. And we were able to contact a wonderful organization called Angels for Change. Many, some of you may know what Angels for Change and is run by uh, the wonderful Laura Bray, who has this really beautiful story of one of you know, her children um, uh, developing a pediatric cancer during a time of a pediatric oncology drug shortage. And she quit her job in, as an executive to run this nonprofit foundation solely dedicated to obtaining emergency drug uh, that's, yeah, that's in shortage for patients. And uh, we'll talk about her a little bit more in just a second because she helped many, many patients in many hospitals. So let's now talk about the solutions and what patients can do um, to be part of the solution because we would love to work more closely with all of you um, and our foundational partners like the OCR way, our OCRA because together we're going to have a greater voice on Capitol Hill um, and with manufacturers um, to affect real sustainable change. And the good news is that many of the effective, there are effective solutions and these are often preventable problems. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into all of the solutions today, but um, several of the things that we're advocating for is that there has to be an agency at the federal government that has ownership for this, whether it's the FDA or that's administration for 
strategic preparedness and response work, whoever that is, there needs to be ownership of that. We think that chemotherapy drugs need to be on the essential medicines list. We need to assure what's called a regulatory environment to regulate the quality and safety of drug manufacturing that secures and ensures a resilient and steady supply of anti-cancer drugs, otherwise known as chemotherapy. This is an ethical and moral priority and obligation. We must ensure that manufacturers are consistently producing safe and effective drugs. And, um, and we need to work on both the payer level at the, in the private sector, because this is a market issue, as well as at the level of the federal government to assure this. Can we also consider developing a central repository of drugs um, that could be utilized only in cases of emergency? Well, chemotherapy, like all other drugs, expire at a certain point, so it's a little tricky. But you know, having some kind of a stopgap or safety measure that if one of the supply chains dry up, that we have another supply we can tap into readily so that we can keep all of our patients on track is really, really important. So SGO was invited to Capitol Hill to the House Cancer Caucus because of some of our work. Our president, Dr. Angel C. Cord, several of my colleagues, and again, wonderful Tony Desimitz, a Persian Gulf War veteran, diagnosed with advanced stage ovarian cancer during the pandemic was there and her story was so compelling and she said you know i'm a warrior i spent 35 years in a uniform between being a police officer a police chief and being a soldier in war and i'm going to continue to do my part to be healthy and active she's going to continue to do her part to help you know that she was doing so much to help other ovarian cancer patients through her advocacy is just incredibly admirable it's an honor to have partnered with her this briefing is available um, online um, where we talked, you know, our team talked one on one with uh, several legislators and leaders of the House Cancer Caucus that help help lead what kind of cancer regulation regulatory laws are going to be created. And they're looking at several drug shortages bills right now. We worked with ASCO. Um, we're working with the NOCC, the OCRA and others um uh, the GOG um to uh to enable legislation and we helped draft legislation at the request of the House Cancer Caucus for a, what a drug shortages bill would look like um some of those things that we recommended again I've already just talked about making sure we thought that the the office of the strategic preparedness and response team really should help lead this effort with the FDA um and um, the House Energy and Commerce um, uh, Drug Shortage Bill or the Drug Shortage Prevention Act is now um, being considered. Um, this would um, you know, require the uh, greater resilience in the, support, in the supply chain. It um, would give the FDA more authority to have earlier notification from a company if there's a supply chain issue anticipated so that the FDA can then look for alternatives. What the FDA did in this case is they were able to get additional cisplatin and carboplatin from overseas from other manufacturers. But that's a process that takes time. And so with more notice of, of there being a problem, we can make sure that providers, healthcare providers like me, patients um, get, get what they need and we're not scrambling last minute to help with that. We also wanted to recommend incentivizing, giving tax incentives to manufacturers who are not making much business out of producing these drugs. How do we incentivize them to produce these generic and in injectable drugs? Because it's a national priority that we do that for our patients. Our patients' lives are depending on it. How do we also um, incentivize better quality, improved quality manufacturing? And so there's a lot of different things that we're looking at here. And we're also looking at expanding drug expiration dates to mitigate shortages. Many drug expiration dates, the drug is good well beyond the expiration date. It's sort of an arbitrary designation. Sometimes it's based on science, sometimes not. Um, but in many cases, those expiration dates could be expanded so that we have more chemotherapy drug available. So I am very, am very happy to share all my slides with you, and I'm not going to go through all of the legislative solutions here that we've either proposed or that we've endorsed that have come um, you know, from the government, but um, I want you to know this is on our SGO website as well for anyone to read and that we're working very, very hard to not just mitigate the short term issues, which I will say the 
the platinum, carboplatin issue is so much better now. Most hospitals in the U.S. have an adequate supply of the carboplatin, cisplatin, and methotrexate. Some of the drugs, though, still remain in shortage that I mentioned, and so it's kind of a bit cyclical. We just want to prevent this from happening again. We can mitigate things acutely, but we want to put in policies that help prevent this from happening to our patients again. And so the, so this is, again, this is a picture of Laura Bray and her family. This is her website, angelsforchange.org. She has just a wonderful knowledge of the drug industry and has relationships with, with industry and pharmaceutical partners. She was able to help hundreds of patients and many centers around the country obtain uh, emergency chemotherapy drug when the hospital's normal avenues to supply get chemotherapy drug were not available. She's a hero and um, we worked really closely with her at the SGO and to help pair patients and hospital systems up with her and then those that directly contacted her as well. So just keep that in mind that there are several foundations like Laura's who are helping us on the nonprofit side. Um, the end drug shortages um, campaign is really important to the end drug shortages alliances that you see the website here. I really recommend, so in terms of what patients can do, there's a lot that patients can do actually uh, to partner with us. You can join the End Shortages Alliance, which is listed here. Um, this is uh, a really sophisticated uh, nonprofit group with multidisciplinary stakeholders that are working to address drug shortages on a long-term basis, and they have many patient advocates involved. You can support the SGO and FWC legislative and policy efforts. And so if you become a member or a patient, lots of members, uh, patients can become members or just follow us on online if you don't wanna be a member. And we'll post things about like, hey, please help support this legislation because the more people that um, Congress hears from that want a bill to pass or that think an issue is important, the more it'll be important to congressional leaders. And so what we do is we do this take action legislation. What all people need to do is click on a link and it's so cool. It will like take you right to, you put in your name and your like zip code and stuff and it'll, and it'll take you right to who your congressperson is. And we've already drafted the letter that can go to that congressperson and you just need to push a button. It takes like 25 seconds to send a letter to your congressperson. And that allows us to not them not just to hear from uh, providers, but also from patients. So I'd be very happy to take any questions. Um, thank you so much um, for partnering with us. The work that's being done at the OCRA is tremendous. And we wanna make sure the amazing research and advances of the OC OCRA are available to all of our patients and that we're not dealing with nuisance drug shortages uh, that can impact patients' lives ever, ever again. So thank you so much again, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I don't know if um, people can put questions in a chat or Tracy or Bart, um, if, uh, if, if there are no questions, I'm very happy. This is my email if anyone has any questions, um, but I'll stay on for a couple minutes and you can add your questions into the chat. I'd be very happy to answer them. Someone Amanda? said, yes. Uh, this is Laurie Baker. I just wanted to thank you. Um, you know, it's so frustrating, um, you know, to have so much reliance on foreign drug manufacturing companies for these critical drugs for our life. Um, and, and then just the whole, you know, as we all just roll our eyes about the um, uh, economic um, realities yeah. of who wants to produce it because they can get, you know, $400 for a pill versus uh, a, a generic and that sort of thing. So, but I just what, what really strikes me at this is I just really appreciate what the organizations are doing uh, to try to change the legislation and try to provide um, better oversight and better um, ways of dealing with it. So that's what I really come away with is just appreciating what you've done here to um, and, and all the different organizations to try to keep, you know, making improvements in that area. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. This has been incredibly humbling, um, you know, 
chemo drug charges were not on my bingo card this year as <laughs> coming in as president elect of the SGO. Uh, it's been a really meaningful, um, it's been really meaningful for me to be a part of this because I've had family members and I've had patients deeply affected by this. And, uh, and we just, we just, we've got to do better than this. The reality too, we have several US companies that manufacture these drugs. There's quality control issues at US companies too, not just overseas. So we got to do better across, across all sectors, but thank you, Lori. Um, can you see the questions? Um, the, the questions, and most people are really thanking you oh, for an thank informative you so and important session. This has been so, so helpful. We had one last question from yes. Patricia who asked that she had read that sometimes the doses would get in, cut in half. How would a patient know if this happened? Well, great question. Um, so we we were required, we are required to notify a patient if any any changes in their treatment regimen are performed, whether a drug is changed, a dose is reduced, a, a dose schedule is changed. So you would have known at your institution whether that had happened or not, um, unless they were really minuscule changes that we make, you know, like a one to 2% change in the chemotherapy dose. If there was a big change, like 10, 15, 20% change, or more, you would, you know, you're required to be notified as a patient so you can understand your treatment options. And there's that wraps. Oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, I think there was one more question. Has there been any increase in production anywhere? Yes. I mean, several of the manufacturers are back online with improved quality metrics. But yes, the legislation we're working to support will hopefully put those stop stopgap measures in place and assure quality moving forward so we don't have the same issue again. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I think, again, overall, most of the chat people are talking about that they're going to take advantage of the way that you have um, suggested to track this issue and really great appreciation for everything you've presented. We thank you all. I think you've got now a, a whole core group of people who are going to be advocates and join you and OCRA in being um, partners in, in making sure this doesn't happen again and people are protected. We thank you for your time and for joining us for this session. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks for a wonderful conference.